Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Facebook Live conversation. It's wonderful to be with you all today. Uh, my name is John Lustria. I'm the Education Coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. And I'm joined today by uh, Melissa DeVelvis, soon to be Dr. Melissa DeVelvis. Uh, she just recently defended her uh, her PhD, or no, well, yeah. just to get her PhD, she defended her dissertation uh, recently, and uh, we'll have her talk about that in just a second. Um, before we uh, get started today, I want to give folks um, time to, to jump on board the live stream uh, so you can join us. Uh, please share the stream around so more people can see it. Uh, it really helps us out the more uh, the more eyes we can get on these, uh, the better. Uh, it's fun to have you with us today. And, and while you're doing that, while you're liking it and sharing it around, uh, go ahead and comment in the, uh, in the comments uh, where you're watching from today. See, we got Vicki watching from Massachusetts. Very exciting. Uh, and it's been fun, uh, as we've said on some of these streams, to see um, some of the same folks uh, pop in the comments uh, on a regular basis. It's been very enjoyable, um, you know, building this uh, uh, following through these live videos. And, um, you know, we might be physically distant, but um, we're kind of socially connected in, in this way. So that's been, been very fun to see. So thank you so much for all the support watching these, uh, watching these videos. See, we got Bethany from Richmond with us today. Wonderful. Um, so as you're uh, getting on the stream, you're sharing it around. Again, sharing it helps us so much, not only for other people to watch live, but also for uh, people to watch later. Um, these videos do continue to exist on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. There's a, a little bit of a, a couple day delay before they get up on the YouTube channel, but uh, if you like our Facebook page, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll still have access to these videos uh, after they, they premiere live. So if you, if you share it uh, and someone doesn't watch it live, they can always go back and find it. If you, know, you, you think of that person that you know would really enjoy it, um, they, can, they can watch it afterwards. So for those of you just tuning in, um, I just want to thank everyone so far that's uh, watched all of the videos we've been posting. It means so much to us. Um, and with the museum's doors closed during this time of uh, quarantine here, um, it's, it's been wonderful to see uh, your generosity. Uh, you've been donating to the museum. Uh, we've had several people become members as a result of watching this video to help support these efforts. And, and we can't thank you enough for that. It's been uh, wonderful. Uh, and we're, we're so blessed by your generosity. Uh, and we would ask and you know, continue asking uh, to, for, for donations, to become a member, uh, things like that really, really help uh, the museum keep being able to do things like this. Uh, and I know I've had uh, a good time watching the videos, being a part of some of the videos uh, and all that sort of thing. So with that, uh, all that said, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get started here. Um, so for those of you who weren't here at the very beginning, if you haven't seen me before, my name is John Lustria. I'm the Education Coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. It's wonderful to be with you all today. And I have with me uh, Melissa DeVelvis, uh, soon to be Dr. Melissa DeVelvis. Uh, and we were uh, in the same cohort together in graduate school at the University of South Carolina. So Melissa, it's wonderful uh, to have you with us today. Hey, John, it's so good to see you. I, I miss y'all and hi, hi, Jake in the comments. I saw you as well. It's been a long time since we've seen in person, but it's it's great to do this. We should do this more often outside of the museum as well. <laughs> I agree. Uh, so uh, Melissa, tell us uh, a bit about your, your time at University of South Carolina, what your uh, dissertation was about and um, and other kind of research interests you have. So yeah, um, more general, genuinely, oh goodness, off to a great start. Uh, more generally, I uh, am a historian of uh, US South uh, antebellum women, uh, specifically 19th century South. Um, right now, looking at the Civil War era, uh, my dissertation defended last month. So as soon as the university sends me that certificate on 
May, in May, I guess by mail, because we're not graduating in person, uh, that, that doctorate is 100% acquired, which is great. But uh, my dissertation is about uh, gendering secession in South Carolina and taking an explicit look at women and their thoughts and consciousnesses about this. And um, I've argued that they've really been left out of the conversation, especially about secession. And it's such a crucial time period, though short, because we have these books about the antebellum era. And then we have these books about the Civil War period. And secession is either kind of where your book ends, uh, kind of as an epilogue, or it's just a very brief kind of intro to get to the Civil War material. And I'm finding that, especially with these women, they're one and the same. These are the same women that were antebellum, uh, usually plantation mistresses. Um, these are the same women that become the Civil War nurses that we're about to talk about. And they're the same women that uh, live in this new world of reconstruction. And so I'm trying to help smooth that gap, pay attention to women's thoughts and ideas. And as we're probably aware of, there are ideas in the 19th century about what women can and cannot say or do due to ideas about womanhood. And so sometimes you have to take a more creative approach. Uh, I've been looking at emotions history. I've been looking about how women talk about the weather and religion, all of these ways that they can talk about politics without transgressing these spheres, essentially, these ideas of propriety. And that's also a lot of what I do with these women nurses as well. They're thrown into a situation where how can we still uphold these ideas of women and propriety, but be able to adapt to our changing circumstances. So my interests are, again, uh, I'm consider myself trained as a women's historian, uh, but also I love the idea of the Civil War era. Uh, we can't just start the Civil War with what either Sumter or Bull Run, and we can't just end it at Appomattox. It ended so gradually in so many different places. And so I really like this idea of expanding our um, idea of our time periods, which are just enforced by historians in the first place. So that's my, that's my spiel about my research um, here in, uh, in the South. I, again, like I said, I uh, still am teaching at the University of South Carolina, but I'm living in Augusta, Georgia, which is right across the border. So um, greetings from the deep south to all the people that are uh, commenting from more of the, uh, the border south in our Maryland and our Virginias in the Facebook comments is what I'm seeing here. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. So it's, it's almost like um, you're, you're, dissertation is kind of like the lost episodes, um, <laughs> like a, uh, a great TV drama, um, you know, between the antebellum period and the uh, the reconstruction period. I think that's a, a really clever idea to really draw that out. <laughs> so, yeah. Would, uh, go ahead. <laughs> I just agree. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're right. My work is brilliant. <laughs> So uh, what we're here to talk about today is uh, some other work that uh, Melissa has done, in this case for um, well, our, our sister museum, the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office uh, Museum, that's uh, all part of the umbrella of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. She wrote a terrific blog post um, about uh, Cornelia Hancock and how Civil War nurses, specifically her in this case, uh, dealt with the trauma of nursing and providing care on the front lines. Um, so to start with, uh, talk a little bit about Cornelia Hancock, her life and her time as a nurse and why you think she's such an interesting person to write about. Yeah, um, Cornelia is one of my favorites. I've, I've looked at other women nurses as well and I just keep coming back to her because everything that other nurses say, she just says so much more explicitly and just spends so much more time on it. But um, Cornelia Hancock is, uh, she was a Quaker woman. She was born in 1840 and she served uh, as a nurse from 1863 to 1865. So a little bit later in the war. Um, she was actually never a um, member of the U.S. Sanitary Commission. She is actually the woman who uh, you mentioned in an earlier one of the series, John, uh, was turned away by Dorothea Dix uh, for being too young and too rosy cheeked. So again, these are these ideas of female propriety. Um, if you were too beautiful or too young, uh, it was thought that you would distract the soldiers or you would be a source of impurity in the, um, in the camp. And so after she was denied entry in the U.S. Sanitary Commission, she um, was 
given kind of an escort by her brother-in-law, Henry T. Henry T. Child, who was a volunteer surgeon. And so that's actually how she got to Gettysburg, which is when her writings begin. Um, so uh, Quaker woman, very much a pacifist. So you could see why she would be devoted to um, helping people on the front lines. Um, but her diary is super explicit um, as to the experience of, I mean, she starts in Gettysburg. So, you know, she really hits the ground running. Wow, that's a heck, of a heck of a place to start. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's just, her diary is so explicit. And um, again, I guess a content warning, like truly uh, very, very detailed about the amount of kind of, for lack of a better word, gore that we're looking at here. Um, and so she continued to follow along, was much beloved by the soldiers. Again, not working with the Sanitary Commission, kind of a rogue agent, if you will. Um, she goes through the Battle of the Wilderness, the Siege of Petersburg. Uh, she works a lot at the hospital in City Point, which most of your, um, your patrons and fans are familiar with. Um, and then actually, after the war, she opens a, um, a school in Mount Pleasant in South Carolina for newly freed African Americans. So she continues this work uh, throughout her life. Um, she uh, works for the Children's Aid Society from 1883 to 1895. She's a board member, actually, and she uh, she never marries. She uh, died in 1927 um, in New Jersey, and so really a lifetime of uh, service, truly. Um, and I wish I wish we had more diaries from her life, but she, like many others, uh, only started their journals in uh, during the Civil War, which again, as a historian of secession is a little frustrating <laughs> that they didn't start it just a couple months earlier. But, um, but yeah, so she's, she's great. She's um, really, truly seems to be quite a hard worker. Some of these women get to the front lines and they're like, I don't like this, but she really, she really buried her head and did the work. Yeah, it's, it's really incredible um, learning about some of the, the women who dedicated their time as nurses during the Civil War, like Cornelia Hancock, uh, like a Clara Barton, um, there are some kind of similarities um, that they, they go on after the war to have long mm -hmm. careers of humanitarianism, um, which I just think is, is cool in that, you know, some kind of crisis moment inspires people for their entire life yeah. um, to do good for others. Um, and so I, I think, you know, one of the things we've been talking about at the museum is this whole idea is that we can find hope in history. Um, and, and I think that is one example uh, of it. And we're trying to find as much hope in history as we can uh, during uh, this time of the COVID-19 crisis. Mm -hmm. And so Cornelia Hancock's another great example uh, of that, I think. Uh, and so to draw even more parallels, um, you know, today, of course, all, all these frontline healthcare workers are experiencing you know, or will experience, they haven't yet, you know, intense fatigue, exhaustion, because they're working out very long shifts, uh, and all kinds of, you know, mental fatigue and exhaustion, uh, and mental trauma, just being up close with all this, this suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, did, how did Cornelia Hancock write about that? Um, how did she describe those sorts of experiences that she had? So Hancock, well, of uh, as I mentioned, first she just starts, hits the ground running in Gettysburg and is truly overwhelmed with what I believe she mentions of the wagons full of amputated limbs leaving and then returning as soon as possible for just another load. So she really almost immediately has to start numbing herself. Um, what they use is the word benumbed to the suffering at which they see. And so there is a lot of kind of, not so much escapism so much because she's not um, daydreaming or watching Netflix like I'm doing, but um, it is a very much a hardening of one's mental psyche, uh, which she realizes almost immediately is going to be necessary in order to continue doing the work that she's doing. Um, but you also see uh, a lot of comfort um, coming from these nurses. And one of my arguments is that even though um, we see that a lot of women nurses, with a few exceptions, there's a, a female doctor that leaves a diary behind as well. Um, they're not allowed to do a lot of the medical procedures that we see nurses do today. It's a lot of caretaking. Um, and so some people would maybe say, well, that's not as medical, so that's not as important. And what I actually see is the role of these women in providing the support to these um, wounded soldiers, um, the comforts of touch 
which I think we can definitely see right now is really missing, um, that you can have even just holding the hand of a soldier, reading to them in the company, the comforts they're providing are truly a balm to these patients. But in order for them to provide this comfort, and keep going, it is a lot of hardening, a lot of numbness. She said, I believe that I can watch a man's head taken off, I believe, and not even react to it. So she is really becoming quite stoic. Yeah, and I, I promise she is, she is explicit in what she's talking about here. Um, but also keeping busy. Uh, these women, um, this is a quote from um, Harriet Eaton, not Hancock. Uh, she's also a US Army nurse. Um, or works for the union, sorry, I guess there, she's not official. Um, she says that she was perfectly calm and who would think of fear, quote, when the dead and dying were lying all around. And so kind of in the way of today where we're taking moments to not focus on the sadness that's happening around us, they're, they're staying busy. Like who can be afraid, who can be distracted when there's, there's, a, there's work to do. Um, so you see a lot of that, um, you see um, Hancock mentions that she she does have a laugh with some friends and they do form a camaraderie between these medical workers um, and they write a lot. Um, writing um, and for the journal, the people, uh, those of you who journal today, um, writing is almost like a safety valve, like they can't keep it inside and they have to get it on the page. Um, even if that just means that they're keeping, you'll see with a lot of diaries, they start off reacting to everything and they can't stop writing about these things that they're seeing and then slowly by the end it's more like a log like this many people did these rounds in this ward and so you do see them maybe becoming more numb to it even through their writing but a lot of the times they take to their diaries to to get it out really and I, I think that's really interesting and with with Hancock in particular the edited volume that I believe Jake has posted um, I should mention her writings are free, or not free, um, <laughs> they're not in the archive, they're, they're published if y'all want to read it yourself, um, highly recommended, but her letters versus her diaries are very different. Her diary is a lot more, which is usually the opposite of what I see, her diary is brief logs and descriptions, and her letters home are the ones that are more kind of describing the scenario to someone else. So she changes her audience depending on if it's to her or if it's to her friends. Um, but yeah, so these are some ways they keep busy. They have to take a break and not take a break, but remove themselves from the situation. Um, and sometimes that requires a lot of kind of mental hardening is what I see in, in her writings. Yeah, uh, your point about numbing, I, I think is really interesting. Um, especially in conjunction with the whole point about being busy. I mean, I haven't had that many very intense experiences in my life, but when I think about those, what I do remember from being in the moment, you know, I wasn't necessarily feeling that much as it was happening. It was just, you know, staying busy. This has to get done. This has to get mm -hmm. done. This has to get done. Uh, and there wasn't a lot of time for panic in the moment, but it was sort of afterwards looking back and like, oh yeah, that, that wasn't great. I didn't enjoy that. Um, and it's not those kind of reflective moments that I, that at least for me, when that started to kind of wash over me. Um, so I think that that whole point about busyness uh, is, is a really good one and, and using the word numbing because like you know, you're not feeling or at least focusing on your feelings so much when you're busy. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's good. And there was something else. Oh, uh, you're talking about them laughing, um, which actually reminds me of Scrubs. Uh, which is a great <laughs> program that I would recommend to everybody. Um, it's it's a you know a 21st century comedy uh, series about um, you know about doctors uh, and but like it's it's a comedy and like people like patients regularly die on the show and you know one of the 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 comments that your points that was made in the show is like you know why do you not take this seriously? And, and uh, I think it was Dr. Cox was like, well, I can't, if I take every death seriously, I you know, would never make it as being a doctor. So I think humor and the kind of insistence on like kind of making light of certain situations, I think could be important. Were there any instances where you saw uh, Cornelia Hancock or other nurses uh, doing things like that? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, she talked about the laughter. She actually says something really funny about how now she uh, she swears like a sailor and she has to warn her, again, Quaker family at home that uh, these are things that are happening to her. Uh, she and others like uh, Kate Cumming, who is a Confederate nurse, 
um, they, they start to list themselves as soldiers um, and they take pride in their ability to sleep anywhere, to eat hardtack and things like this. So they also form these communities with the soldiers themselves. Um, the role of music is really important. Uh, I look into sensory history a lot when I'm looking at people like Hancock and um, not only what the the negative effects of like constant cannon fire can have on someone, but also the, the role of just the band. Um, Cornelia even had uh, the band played a song for her as like the first lady of the of the camp. And she really, truly loved that. Um, and I should mention that especially for women, um, and, and you pointed out as well with people like Clara Barton, who I actually deliberately did not look at because she was so well known and I wanted to see what else we could find. Um, that they, they are really enjoying the chance to get out and do something. And this is one of the first instances that we see, and it continues after the Civil War, of women being able to leave the home and participate in public activity, but it has to be justified as something that a woman could do, and it has to be appropriate. And so you see all of these nurses, um, and even like poetry from the time period saying that like you're nursing this man like you would be nursing a husband at home and being in the ward means that you were bringing some of the home back to the soldier because that's where a woman is supposed to be. And so a lot of these philanthropies like teaching like public safety and health and things like this, these are things that a nurturing woman could do. And so even though they have these kind of gendered constraints that we today would scoff at, they are truly, I mean, they are seeing how terrible it is to be at war, but they are loving the chance to do something. And so that is something that really helps them keep going is this sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. um, but we've even looked at today, and we'll get into this in a second, if what we talked about was any indication, um, but also the role of music uh, with mental health and PTSD and things like this. And we've seen studies of what music can do for memory with patients with dementia and things like this. And so saying that they listened to music and they made them happy isn't just kind of a cavalier statement. It's truly having a neurological brain lifter for people like this. So much so that I, I think you mentioned with your, with your fight or flight kind of leaving, which is same with me. Once I completed my dissertation, the next day I cleaned my whole house because I just couldn't stop moving. <laughs> but um, Harriet Eaton actually describes how um, a, they were sleeping in an abandoned barn and a bullet goes right past her. And she says, I, this is actually the quote where um, she was perfectly calm and safe in the path of duty who would think of fear when the dead and dying were lying all around. But it's not until afterwards when she's writing a letter and apologizing to whoever the audience is um, that she says, quote, I apologize for the state of this letter, quote, mind and body are both affected quiet is producing some reaction after this week's intense excitement so it's not in the moment that she is kind of freezing up like we would expect but afterwards when the silence finally falls so it's the lack of sound which is making her truly come down from this experience and they love the word intense excitement like when they say excitement i would say 70 30 um they're mostly talking about bad excitement um, they can say things are exciting in a good way, but usually like they call secession the great excitement and a lot of them are very worried about that great excitement. And so, um, very, yeah, like you said, like the role of noise, the role of community and music, um, these are things that I think have a true mental effect on these women and on these people uh, in a way that we can't just say like, yeah, they just were there to keep people happy, which I think is just really derivative and puts down the work that they're doing mm -hmm. yeah uh and and your your point about music reminds me of a uh, nurse whose uh letters are in the museum's collection clara jones uh um, yeah. one who i've uh, done a lot of work with um her her patients would often write to her after you know she would go back home uh, or they would get sent to another hospital and they would say, you know, no one sings to us here. Um, and so that that was indeed a common refrain uh, of, you know, people who, you know, were, were with these nurses or, or, you know, things they would do. Uh, but your point about how that has this kind of neurological benefit and how significant music is, I mean, that that's a lot that's like a lot of Civil War medicine in that they're trying some of these pretty modern techniques, but they don't, and well, and some of the things they try are sort of silly to us today. Um, like they would sometimes hang pine branches 
uh, in the in the, in the hospitals because you know well if it smells bad it's not healthy so if it smells good it'll probably help them get better and you know that's not going to hurt anybody but it's not going to have any sort of actual healing effects but a lot of these uh, other things they're doing like singing um, and you know that kind of element of physical touch that the nurses provide holding their hands and things like this it has all these unintentional benefits that they seem to kind of think are working um, but they don't totally know why. Uh, or for example, there uh, a lot of nurses kind of insist on cleanliness, which we know today is you know really important. They're thinking about it more as in, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. This is kind of an important thing that just should be should be done. Um, they're not thinking about it in terms of a life saving practice, but it's like a lot of civil war medicine. The way that they're thinking about it is not how we think about it today, but it is effective which I think is, is one of the things that makes Civil War medicine really interesting. Um, so you were talking about, well, some, some terms that they used back then, like, you know, intense excitement uh, and like, you know, how they're, how they're writing about this sort of thing. So when you, a trained historian, um, are, are going back and you're looking at some of these journals and diaries and things, um, what are you looking for? How do you read them? Um, what, what things kind of jump out at you when you go through these as you're trying to craft your, your arguments or these articles or blogs or, or what have you? Yeah, it, it, it's kind of like you said, like these words that keep jumping out, like if you were in the archive and constantly reading the same stuff over and over, which bless, love that part of the job, although sometimes if it's been three hours and it's cursive, you start to go a little cross-eyed, as you know well. Um, <laughs> you really just it's it's that fine line that we have to travel as historians because it's sometimes irresponsible to you know kind of retroactively diagnose someone with someone with something like one I'm not a doctor uh, oh I am a doctor but I'm not a medical doctor <laughs> right you're not, you're not that doctor yeah exactly but, yeah, but we we, we, can... we might not be doctors but we we do play doctors on Facebook Live. <laughs> And it I has mean, to be super clear, don't take any medical advice we give you, go to a real doctor, or well, <laughs> a medical doctor, not a philosophy yeah. doctor. <laughs> you know, medical doctors co-opted the um, doctorate in the first place, I digress. Um, That's right. <laughs> um, but no, very important, listen to doctors today, especially in today's environment. But, but truly, like, as a historian, I mean, words matter. And so I try to describe how they're feeling by really relying on their own words. And anytime I make a statement about like, she felt sad after this, which one, I don't know if I would ever just say it straight like that, but I would then accompany a quote to say like, this is how she's expressing it. Um, I like to show um, as, as much as I can in writing, how much mental real estate is she giving to these events? What does it mean when she's talking a ton about these things that are happening? And kind of, as I mentioned, what does it mean when she slowly stops talking about them? Does that mean that she wants to talk about it and cannot? Does that mean that she's become accustomed to it? And my theory from reading a lot of these is that she has um, benumbed herself. And so these entries that used to be brand new to her now would just be writing the same old, same old over and over again as it becomes the new normal. But yeah, it's something that kind of, as we mentioned with uh, 19th century medicine, using their own words and looking to see what the meaning of that word was in the time period is really a big part of my analysis. And I would never go back and say these women had PTSD because again, not a doctor. And mm -hmm. two, I think there's a really fine line to travel about applying our diagnoses back on people who would not have had a term for it. It's a big issue that um, being a study of um, a historian of like gender and sexuality, like how can we take today's frameworks and apply them to the past? It's, it's hard. And so what I will say instead is very carefully say, these things that she is writing about and these emotions experienced after this battle is often or is very much similar to what we today see in people who experience PTSD. And I'm, I'm fine with using the word trauma. Um, and clearly it was a traumatic experience, but really just being very careful and delicate with our words because um, I'm, I'm never gonna know if what they experienced was PTSD, but I can say that this is similar to what we see today because that is a true statement if you can 
compare two accounts of two wars and two experiences, and they're similar, we can say they're similar. But um, something that y'all have already done, so we don't need to get a ton into it, but like the idea of um, PTSD wasn't even around, then we don't even have shell shock at this time period yet. Uh, but we do have things like um, homesickness and nostalgia. Uh, and I believe, um, what is it, in 1864, the medical and surgical reporter said that um, nostalgia was, quote, a state of mental depression that made soldiers, quote, extremely favorable to the contraction of disease. And that if a bedridden patient exhibited signs of this disease of the mind, he would very probably die. Um, so basically, if you have nostalgia, if you are homesick, that makes you medically more likely to die in the words of these Civil War soldiers. And we can kind of understand that, like, it's what he's talking about is kind of the will to live, but maybe even describing depression as we see it today. So again, I'm not so interested in saying like, this guy clearly had depression or this woman had depression, but instead understanding their concepts of mental health in that time period, which I think is so fascinating, as you mentioned, they honestly saw the connection between the body and the nervous system in ways that today are pseudoscience, but their ideas about the nerves are in many ways, um, they give more credibility to mental health than some people today, as we're still <laughs> trying to understand um, these invisible ailments like anxiety and depression and things like this. They saw it as the outdoor, your environments had a role on your nervous system and you could become vulnerable to these environments. And then of course, goodness, when you add in women, you get nervousness, you get hysteria, you get all of these um, diseases of the nerves that are supposed to be more affected on women. One, because they are supposed to be the more emotional sex, um, which is sometimes a good thing, especially when you're a civil war nurse, you're emotional, you're providing emotional comfort. But also that means that if you react in any other way, it's because you are medically more likely to become weak because of the nerves and things like this. So you see it, these ideas of mental health are really fascinating to me and it will be uh, a trial throughout my career as a historian to make sure that I'm giving due justice to their words and making sure I'm not retroactively diagnosing them because that is not, not my wheelhouse. <laughs> It's it's a very fine line to walk, uh, and just this past January, we had uh, um, someone present at a uh, museum, uh, Hilda Kuntz, uh, who has a background in in mental health and counseling, and um, she she was saying that uh, she that you know just in her estimation, uh, and I hope I'm getting this number right, she, she correlated somewhere around forty different terms that might refer to PTSD, or at least what we would kind of think about PTSD as. So um, kind of getting the right words for this sort of thing uh, is a, incredibly challenging um, when, when reading these, these diaries uh, and journals and letters and all that. And then of course you have to keep in mind who are they writing this to? Um, you know, do they wanna let on that they're really experiencing something challenging, don't they? Um, so it's it's you're you're exactly right. It's it's very challenging, um, but I, let's keep talking about this idea of audience. Uh, how do you? What have you noticed um, either with Cornelia Hancock specifically, or any other uh, nurses that you've you've dealt with? Um, how did they attempt to kind of explain their experiences to people at home, either relatives or friends or somebody else entirely? Um, who, you know, haven't experienced this, um, that, you know, they, they don't have a frame of reference uh, for this sort of thing. So how does she try and describe those things? What, like, for example, what adjectives maybe uh, jump out at you? I muted myself, sorry. Um, <laughs> I can give you a, a very detailed description of how she first talks about Gettysburg, and then I can fill in talking about Hancock. Again, I want, I want to reiterate that the historian in me feels like I have to say this. My sample size is much larger, but she just continues to be the most explicit. <laughs> and so I keep going back to Hancock, even though I have people like Harriet Eaton and all these other women who are expressing the same thing. Um, but yeah, I can give you um, her uh, initial thoughts when she arrives at Gettysburg. 
And, and actually, before you dive into that, now yeah. might be a good time to pull in a, a question from our comment section. Robert, uh, my, my dear dad, uh, he, he asked, uh, how long after the battle did Cornelia Hancock arrive at Gettysburg? Um, and, and do you happen to know kind of which area or hospital she served in? Right. So um, she uh, arrived in Gettysburg three days after the battle. Oh, and wow, so the, yeah, and the first thing that she says is describes the set, the stench. Um, I, I do a, a sensory history of her um, and kind of go through the senses, which is kind of neat, at least to me. Um, but the first uh, thing and everyone and is- I'll take this opportunity too, to plug uh, on Friday on our Facebook channel, we're gonna be uh, premiering a, a short interview I did with uh, another sensory historian uh, all about smell. Um, so you ought to tune in, you might enjoy that. <laughs> yes, yes, you know, I, I, I love to pop in on these for sure. Yeah, no, I love, um, the olfactory historians are, are, are good fun. Um, That's right, it's uh, Dr. Melanie Keekley. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, uh, no, I'm, I, I think my, my advisor, Mark Smith, who wrote a book about the sensory history of the Civil War, uh, maybe is a bit disappointed that I didn't go more into the census for my dissertation, <laughs> but um, doing it now with, with this work here. Um, and oh, just to finish that, so three days after Gettysburg, um, she eventually joined um, and just followed along. She never actually was officially in the Sanitary Commission. Um, the um, the two corps, I think that's it. Yeah, is that how you say that? Uh, second corps is second corps. Okay. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you're a historian and you read all the words and you never have to say them. Um, <laughs> and, and so she she followed them essentially and was able to uh, kind of latch on to her volunteer surgeon brother in law, who again was volunteer, so not attached. Um, so they had a lot more freedom. Um, and she uh, she never actually, at that point, she did not work at an established hospital at Gettysburg. She worked um, in the field hospital before moving onward. Uh, so she was literally like on the battlefield and did not get kind of established until they had moved to a uh, city point, I believe. Um, but so here's her, here's her quote. And this is, I believe it's in a letter. Um, a sickening, overpowering, awful stench announced the presence of the unburied dead on which the July sun was mercilessly shining and at every step the air grew heavier and fouler until it seemed to possess a palpable, horrible density that could be seen and felt and cut with a knife. So the, the smell and the heat being so oppressive that you could literally cut through it. Some women became too sick to even be able to work in the hospitals because of the smell. And this is one of, my, one of the reasons why I make the point about numbness and hardening is that slowly the smell, which is the first thing every woman writes about, disappears from the writings until they go somewhere else and then they're hit with smell again. And so this is really proof that they just become used to it. Um, anyway, to continue, not the presence of the dead bodies themselves, swollen and disfigured as they were and lying in heaps on every side was as awful to the spectator as that deadly nauseating atmosphere. She talks about the gruesome sight of appendages, um, so appalling was the number of the wounded, so helpless seemed the few who were battling against tremendous odds to live, so overwhelming was the demand that one's senses were benumbed by the awful responsibility. So, a lot to unpack here. One of her mm -hmm. first entries as she gets to Gettysburg, and so you can tell that she's overwhelmed by this. She is writing it down and she's writing to someone. So in this instance, she is way, she's open and candid about what she's seeing here. But later, her letters, uh, let me find another one for you. Again, I'm so, so much of my work is quote heavy that I wanna make sure that I don't just summarize it for you guys. Um, so at this point she's saying, I feel assured I shall never feel horrified at anything that may happen to me hereafter because of Gettysburg. Um, and then um, one of her neighbors dies of natural causes. And she essentially says, and I think I wrote this in my blog that, um, uh, Oh no, she just says that um, it is a very sorrowful thing to me if I was home, but here I am so accustomed to hear of what, first one person I know and then another being captured that it does not impress me as if I was out of this miserable place. And so she's hearing about her neighbors from home being captured at war. She's hearing about a neighbor that one, the neighbor dies of natural causes. And so she's just callously saying, how am I supposed to react to this? with sadness when I see this every single day. 
And so she's writing home saying like, instead of saying my condolences, oh, how terrible as you can kind of expect, she's kind of just saying, you know, if I were home, it would be bad, but this is a whole new world for me. And I don't have the emotional time or energy to respond to this. And she gets in trouble, or not in trouble, but she gets, um, we don't, I don't have the letters that were written um, from her family members. Perhaps they're in the special collections library in which they're housed, but the published edition only has Cornelia's words in a lot of instances. Um, but they're worried that she's living alone and she's riding horseback, probably not side saddle. And so they're saying that she's being improper. And she says, quote, um, those complaining cannot expect everyone to be satisfied to live in as small a circle as themselves in these days of great events. So at first she is totally overwhelmed with what's happening. And then slowly as she's writing home, it's just really, really annoyed and agitated saying, you have no idea what it's like. And I, I, they're losing a common level of expression with each other. Like she's no longer able to communicate without getting defensive or coming across as heartless. And so again, this is happening to other women, but hers is just so explicit that I keep going back to Cornelia, this 23, 24 year old woman writing so candidly about, yeah, sure, maybe if I were at home, that would be an issue, but this is, this is different times. Yeah, it, it speaks to a number of things. Uh, number one, how important like a shared experience is in building a relationship. Um, so, you know, if you don't experience the same thing as someone else, um, you know, then it's hard to, like you said, it's almost like kind of losing a language. Like you can't communicate in the same way as you did if you, you occupy the same space. And the other thing that that kind of makes me think of is, is the remarkable ability of human beings to um, adapt to a new normal. And we're kind of experiencing that a little bit now. I mean, obviously it's a little bit less intense than or and less visceral than what Cornelia Hancock and other Civil War nurses had to experience. But, you know, if we were to, um, you know, uh, uh, write about, you know, what our, our days are like now and compare that to how we felt on like, you know, the first day of uh, sheltering in place, staying at home, you know, now it's, you know, I mean, everyone is, I think, having sort of a different experience, certainly, but at least for me, it's like, well, here we are, it's just another day. Uh, whereas the first few days, like, this is weird, kind of cool, but kind of bad, but weird. It's this, it's this whole thing. And, and now it's like, well, you know, we're, we're just in the midst of this. And, and likewise, those on the front lines, I think, you know, when this all this whole COVID-19 first started, I'm sure their experience in those early days is very different than, than their experience now in that you know, it's just kind of another day working in the new normal. And so that that's kind of the sense that I got as you're reading those quotes, like she just kind of continued to adapt. And uh, over time, it's just this new, uh, this new setting. I think it also speaks and I mean, there's, there's so much Joan Cashin, for instance, a historian has written a ton about the home front experience. But I, I wonder too, and this is something I'd love to get into, and you just brought it into my head, but is there survivor's guilt isn't the right term, but the feeling of helplessness of being at home, which I know for a fact, um, so many women in the South, which is again, my specialty, um, just write about just waiting for a letter. Like there's nothing else they can do but wait, but just the feeling of the absolute privilege that I have being at home, being not a medical worker, being able to continue teaching from online. And just, I can totally understand the frustration of people working in these ICUs and working in ERs and stuff that see people walking around without masks or complaining about how lonely they are quarantining at home. Like that is like, I, I of course want to, my, my experiences are valid and it's okay to feel oppressed and worried and lonely, but also I can truly imagine how Cornelia must have felt being on the front lines being like, all right, cool. You're at home with your cute dog and your online classes and I'm sitting here putting my life on the line. And so that's, again, this, this home front versus being actually experiencing it, this back and forth, again, like you said, the shared experience, but also this gulf between people who are on the front lines and the people who are, I mean, we're doing our job by staying at home. That's what they want from us. But also, yeah, it's just, I truly cannot comprehend what they must be going through because I'm not there in the same way that Cornelia is writing home as well. Yeah, I, 
And thank you for kind of drawing that idea out and making it even like underscoring a little bit. Yeah, it's this, it's this difference between being on the front lines in, you know, any sort of conflict, even conflict on a small scale, like interpersonal conflict, like, you know, being there when say an argument happens and just being somewhere else. Um, it's hard to kind of really relate you know, what happened if, if you weren't there, which is, I guess, sort of the disadvantage that all us historians work at because none of us were there um, and we're, we're trying to write about it. So um, yeah, that, that's a really interesting idea. And I think we um, stumbled on, I think a really important point, not only of all of this, this whole COVID-19 business, but kind of all of historical writing and the challenges that, that we all face. Uh, and th there's a great quote um, it's the, uh, that, that my dad shared with me, it's in like either the preface or the forward to a, a book. And of course, I can't remember what it is, but the quote is, uh, something happened beyond that. We can't be sure of anything. I like that. I like that a <laughs> which lot. Is, uh, which is kind of funny, a little depressing, um, and very true. <laughs> I, I've gotten a lot into a lot of dark humor these days um, in the same way that I mean, if anyone reads soldiers letter, sometimes the things they laugh about, you're like, how are you laughing at this, but you you have to find it in in something and this is actually, I don't know if there's any good segue to do this, but um, just to quote again about the numbness and again it's Cornelia. Um, with uh, and, and people that you have had on and have spoken uh, can do this much better than I with the, the advancements in embalming. Um, but also that this used to be pretty much the, the woman's realm of funeral parlors because the body was held in the parlor of a home. And it was really like the, the woman's job to have the body, like it was a family affair. And so there was an intimacy with death and touching a human body that we don't have today because we're kind of afraid to go up to coffins sometimes because it's just, we're so afraid of death because we're not used to having to touch it. Um, and she actually, Cornelia, Cornelia goes in to a, a room. Uh, I think it's just, as is the case with most Civil War hospitals, uh, just a barn that they have repurposed. but. She is essentially going in her free time to sit alone with these dead bodies, which she calls beautiful specimens, and just looking upon how handsome these men are in death. And the embalming process has allowed that to remain longer and stuff. And so she's literally able to look upon death and do it in her free time. Maybe I'm getting a little bit too morbid for this, this afternoon chat. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I do think, I think studies of, death during the 19th century just so fascinating because they're just so much they're not afraid of touch I think in a way that we are today and and people can talk a way more explicitly about this than I can but just on um, recent studies like uh, Diane Somerville's uh, wonderful book on suicide in the Civil War again if you're I mean harden your heart benumb yourself as we saw but to read about um, to read about death I think is really fascinating if you're in the right headspace for it um, and I will say with with arguments about PTSD and trauma and things like this, um, the concept of suicide continues to be in the way that it is today statistically. It's a, it's a male, it's a male. Um, more more men are recorded as taking their own lives, um, either as a result of PTSD or planters in the South who lost everything through Reconstruction. Um, though um, I think they were right to lose everything considering they um, profited off the bodies of enslaved people, but um, I don't wish death upon most people. But either way, uh, you don't see these women in their past and after the war becoming affected by the war in the way that men do um, as soldiers. And I think it's a lot to do with their feeling of helpfulness during the war in a way that soldiers might not feel helpful towards the end. And so just, just to talk about that kind of trauma, a lot of these women were able to make something of it and feel useful in a time of trauma in a way that soldiers, I think, experienced a lot more of the negative effects afterwards. But this is just, I am spitballing. Don't quote me, historians who are watching this. These are my, my theories that I have not yet delved into. <laughs> well, you got you to gotta start somewhere. And uh, just uh, looking in the comments, uh, people are, are loving the, uh, the direct quotes. Vicki, Allison, and Wendy uh, all love the direct quotes. 
Um, so that's a, a major positive. Um, and, and all very recognizable names. It's been fun to see people uh, tune in um, regularly to, to see these. Um, let me see here. Um, uh, so we're, we're kind of coming towards the end of our time. Uh, if people have uh, any questions, feel free to, to drop them in the, uh, in the comments. Uh, and uh, Robert clarified where that quote came from. Something happened beyond that. Nothing is knowable. Um, that's uh, from the forward from the Gettysburg Campaign Atlas. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, one question was emailed to me uh, ahead of time, or it's a, a short series of questions from Adriana. Uh, who is a nurse with 29 years of ER, trauma, orthopedics, ICU, and interventional radiology and cardiology experience. So wow. very cool <laughs> stuff. Um, and who knows uh, substantially more about medicine than I do uh, to the point that it was hard to even kind of comprehend the gist of the question just because I don't even know enough to understand the question. Oh God, I'll do my best. I'm sorry. Well, I, I did a little bit of uh, research on this this morning and it's um, largely going to be unsatisfying. Uh, age <laughs> <one>. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, well, she asked um, what percentage of patients, uh, Civil War patients experienced uh, osteomyelitis, um, which is basically a, a, a bone infection, like the, the bone is sort of diseased and starts decaying. Um, and then what percentage of people that had that ended up uh, passing away. Uh, and a great resource for this uh, because they have actual Civil War bones that suffered from this disease is the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Yes. Different from the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. We're both very cool. Uh, they date from the time of the Civil War. We date from the mid 1990s. Um, so we're a bit more recent than they are, but they, they actually have Civil War bone specimens. Uh, and uh, last year in 2019, uh, the museum staff, we took a field trip to the National Museum of Health and Medicine and they showed us actually some bones that suffered from this. So they, they have that sort of stuff. They'd be great people to contact uh, Adriana about that. Exact numbers are hard to come up with. Uh, they did use that term at the time of the Civil War. There are several case studies about that in the medical and surgical history, uh, but they were not, the numbers weren't tabulated. So it's hard to, to give specific numbers on that. And then she also asked, um, you know, that Florence Nightingale, famous, a uh, woman nurse of the Crimean War um, was advocating for, you know, cleanliness and, you know, early kind of antiseptic practices uh, of cleanliness, sterilization and things like that. Um, and she asked if there are any Civil War nurses uh, that were advocating for this. Oh, um, any, oh absolutely. <laughs> any insight into that? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I should add, I mean, we've talked about we, y'all, have talked about uh, Florence Nightingale a good bit. I should say that she affected um, the mindsets of both Union and Confederate nurses. Um, Kate Cumming, for instance, uh, cites Nightingale as one of the reasons why she wanted to get involved with nursing in the first place. And so um, in the same way that you mentioned the smell of pine, it's this idea of cleanliness. Like Even if germ theory is still a um, a future observation that they have not yet made, um, they do see the importance of um, keeping as much as possible, keeping it aerated, uh, making sure that fresh breezes come through the hospitals, unless you're gonna, you know, freeze to death. Um, this was probably the idea that like the air was stifling and there was this idea of like an unhealthy air um, around them. But so I, I see a lot in my work of women advocating for cleanliness. Um, although one woman, Kate Cumming, again, this, um, she served for the Confederacy. Uh, she was most notably at um, all of the battles at Lookout Mountain in Chattanooga. And then her work is really fascinating. Again, published for if you're ever curious about this kind of abortive nature of fleeing from Sherman. It, he didn't just go straight to Atlanta as we like to see. It was they were camped in Dalton. They had to move a little bit. Are they going to go to Athens from Atlanta and all these things? I digress, I can talk too much. My job is talking. Um, but so Kate actually talks about how you can get used to so much that 
uh, in the same room as there were all of these bloody bandages just on the ground because they needed to just get rid of them. And so this disgusting room, um, she and the doctor just had to just ignore it and just get to work with dressing wounds. Um, and then later she realizes that she brought him food and they ate lunch in the same room. So I'm really sorry for all of y'all who are still eating food right now. Um, but so while they recognize cleanliness, there's also, again, this idea of necessity and this ability to just get down and do it. Um, I should add that a lot of women, for instance, Ada Bacot, who was um, a, uh, a nurse from South Carolina who again went on private funding. For some reason, these nurses who wrote diaries, like I don't have a lot of sanitary commission women in my studies. They exist, obviously. Um, and she's at Monticello. Uh, she has to be begged when she first gets there. This, this lieutenant is like, please, can I like to have his face washed? This really intimate event or occasion of like, you know, running your hand through a strange man's hair at a time where you needed a chaperone to go on a date, especially in the South. And so initially with these Southern ladies and literate Northern and Southern women, um, they are not doing a lot of the cleanliness activities um, as much as like changing bed sheets and like actually shaving the face of a man at first because they think this is way beneath them and there are a lot of nurses who um, are often illiterate so don't keep journals or they're lower class nurses, um, a lot of them doing some of the more the dirty work essentially because they were considered, they didn't have the privileges of ladyship. And of course, we're overlooking the work of enslaved women and enslaved cooks and enslaved laundresses, especially on the Confederate front. All this to say, yes to the cleanliness for sure. They might not have understood as we do today exactly why cleanliness is so important, but um, a lot of these nurses who left records were often like almost superintendent level of making sure schedules and the people were fed. And eventually even the most ladylike of women were um, shaving the faces of strange men that they had never met before. Um, but I do think in our studies of nurses and people have done this um, and I, I'm at fault as well with looking at some of these published sources, um, we're privileging the women who were often doing some more of the the, the cleaner work, the sitting and holding hands while some of the, the more marginalized and less privileged women were the ones that are cleaning out soiled bed sheets and things like this. Of course, war changes everything. So these are just blanket statements on my part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, it, again, kind of like what we were talking about, in certain instances, there are strikingly modern practices. They don't really kind of get why they're working, or in some cases, they're not even sure they are working, yeah. um, but they do happen. Uh, a much more detailed breakdown about kind of the role of germ theory in the Civil War and how it was uh, employed and accepted and mostly not um, was done by uh, my colleague Kyle Dalton last week, and you can find that on our Facebook page, and I think that one's going to be uploaded on the YouTube channel tomorrow or sometime this week, but that's a, a great resource. He did a lot of uh, original research for that, uh, for that presentation. So that, that breaks it down in, in more detail um, there. Um, let me see here. Half of being a historian is just quoting other better people <laughs> and then <laughs> moving straight along. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Um, well, that's uh, all the questions we have here. Uh, I'll just, uh, close briefly by saying thank you so much for watching. Um, and, you know, if you have been enjoying these videos, again, please share them around. Please like them. Uh, it helps the museum uh, quite a bit, uh, getting other people's eyes on them. Uh, and, you know, since the museum's doors are closed, uh, if you consider donating or becoming a member, uh, it really helps us keep doing this sort of thing. And I'm glad that you all have been enjoying it. And if you, if you have enjoyed it, even a small $5 donation goes, uh, goes a long way. Um, so thank you so much, Melissa, for being here. This was uh, good fun, or at least as fun as talking about <laughs> death in the Civil War can be. Is it bad that I really love talking about it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, who knows? <laughs> y'all can psychoanalyze me as much as I psychoanalyze my subjects. I'm fair game for all of y'all, but I do really echo uh, support this museum and institution in Claire Martin Missing Soldiers as much as you can because John and Jake are just wonderful, wonderful people. Um, so I, I endorse the statement and I have <laughs> not been paid to do so.
<laughs> well, thanks. Thanks so much. We appreciate that. So thanks for coming on and um, we'll see you again sometime soon. All right. Bye, everybody. Stay safe.